Natasha is the director of Humanity Plus. Executive director. Executive director. Co-founder of Women in Longevity Leadership and founder, senior faculty of the Center of Transhumanist Studies. She is known for co-founding the transhumanist movement. She was there in very many transvisions and uh, also the, the earliest ones. Um, she has innovated the future body prototype with AI and nanorobotics and achieving a scientific discovery in the persistence of long-term memory in biostasis. She is the co-editor and author of The Transhumanist Reader and Transhumanism, What Is It? Natasha is featured in the New York Times, Vogue, Wired, and Newsweek magazines, and we are very happy to have her here today. Um, I'll pass the mic to you. Hello, good morning. 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 Good jet lag. <laughs> For, um, I'd like to thank the Association of French Transhumanists. I'm studying French, so I cannot pronounce it correctly. I'm still in the beginning studying stages. And I'd like to thank London Futurists as well and do a heartfelt shout out to Arjun. Arjun founded DTrans and Transcedo. He put together the first Transvision conference in Holland, now Netherlands, and um, he is no longer with us, sadly enough but we think of him fondly. His name is on the Transhumanist Declaration as one of the authors on the Transhumanist FAC, and he was early on our email list back in the early 1990s, so he was really an enthusiast. If you want to know what happened to him, please ask someone else, but it's, it's a story in Norway, and we wish him the very best, if he is still with us, but I, I don't think he is. Okay, there. I've had a fascination with the brain and the mind for some time now. My scientific breakthrough is based on long-term memory. And the reason I became interested in long-term memory is because of the increasing rate of dementia. By 2050, it is going to triple. And that is not only the various diseases of dementia, which include multiple sclerosis, ALS, et cetera, but also including Alzheimer's disease, which is a different disease of cognitive properties. So that concerns me, tripling by 2050. And we do know that from a transhumanist perspective that technology does accelerate and there could feasibly <coughs> be some resolve to this growing pandemic. And I hope there is, and maybe Randall will be able to help us with that as well as Anders. But it takes a neuroscientist to understand this far better than me. I just look at the statistics and the trends. Another reason I have great interest in the brain is because I had my brain scan some years ago, and I really loved being in the um, discussion room about what the brain functions are in the different areas of the brain. And the last reason is my mother suffered from memory loss, dementia. And it was really tragic, and most of us will or have faced that, considering the rise in dementia and other cognitive diseases. It's a horrifying reality, and uh, certainly one we want to put our foot down and say, no, no more. But, but long, if I may, no, you may not afterwards, <laughs> thank you. So when we think about the brain and the different properties of the brain and how it functions, it's really quite lovely to think that we have 100 billion neurons in the brain that are functioning. We had 100 billion neurons in the brain when we were little babies and they continue today. And one of the issues that is most often talked about is can we grow neurons at the adult stage? And this is a theory that has been disproven and then proven again, then disproven, and now um, the latest research on it is that yes, indeed, we can grow neurons in the brain at adult stage. So that's the good news of it. But what I'm more concerned about today is the way we think and how we think. How and why are we driven by what excites us like a sugar rush when we see something horrific in the news? 
and it's gotten a term that's called fake news, although I don't find that term very pretty. I often think about what causes the different disruptions in our thinking that makes us want to maybe retaliate, perhaps, or get back at, or find an excuse for something, not admit when we're wrong, or not even question our own theories and truths. Because, as we know, truth changes. Maybe not the core moral values that you hold, but the reality of what is around us. The greater our telescopes, the greater our microscopes, the more we learn and discover what's going on in the world and our place in it. The issue I want to talk about today is part of the brain. It's where, at least I think, the mind resides. And some of the conflicts that I've recognized over the years, especially within transhumanism, is the bias and the theoretical twisting of ideas and the pernicious prattle about who says this and who says that. And it's not just within the transhumanist community itself, it's all around it, because the transhumanist community is within an epoch of social media, where it's really a little bit difficult to find the facts, the truths of a matter. Oh, it's not playing. Okay, let's see if we can get this to play. Oh, sorry, it's not playing. But what he's saying is, do you get tired of the constant erosion of your thoughts and feelings because of the social media that's going around? Are you tired of the disruption in what you think is reality and what someone else is telling you is reality? Do you often find it very difficult to get to the bottom line of what's going on? He says it a lot more effectively than me, but apparently the sound is not working. Okay, so why am I interested in this? I got interested in this about a decade ago when I realized that, oops, okay, I have to have sound. I don't need it for this, but I need it for the other because they're my... Um, three and a half millimeter check. Ooh, okay. I can't mimic that. Um, maybe we, can we go online here? We well, let's try to get it on this. Oh, okay. Thank you. Um, okay, so while he's trying to fix that, I, I run the H Plus Academy Roundtable, and over the past year, I've been bringing people on to the roundtable to discuss why they've written a uh, disparaging their point of view. Oh, okay. Oh, oh, yay! God, don't you love him? The voice, the height, everything. <laughs> Clearly, the intelligence. Uh, no, no, okay, I don't, yeah, I don't. <laughs> let's go beyond that. Okay, let's just make sure that this works. Get the volume up. The concept of war is contentious. Is it a war? Is it seduction? Uh, is it persuasion? Uh, the choice of war is perhaps overstated, although I don't believe it to be. I believe that transhumanism in seeking to overcome some of the most basic elements of being human, including ignorance, disease, old age, death, inevitabilities for all of our ancestors and forebears. So in the sense that it seeks to conquer that which is intrinsically human, it is either an aggressive warfare, perhaps a, a more subtle warfare, or to take uh, the more colorful characters in and around the transhumanist movement serious, perhaps an all-out war on humanity. Uh, all of these narratives spin out of a belief that technology can solve most, if not all, of our problems, it may not be conceived of as a belief among those who hold it, but that conviction is the driving force behind developing these technologies, the driving force behind the philosophies that guide them. But I, I want to be really careful here at least, even if I'm quite irresponsible oftentimes in my polemics and rhetoric, the word transhumanism uh, does Defi it is defined by that small group of thinkers who really develop these ideas, as diverse as they may be. <coughs> but uh, to put it in 
mimetic terms, the meme has escaped its biological host, or to put it in spiritual terms, you guys have summoned a demon. Mm -hmm. All right. <laughs> I thought that was a tasty clip. But you know, there's some truth to it. And there you had myself, um, Max Moore, the author of the modern philosophy of transhumanism as a codified philosopher, and Nell Watson, uh, an AI ethicist, and also um, very involved in transhumanism. He's telling us we've summoned a demon and we gave birth to it, now it's out of our control. There is a little bit of truth to that, considering the negative press about transhumanism. So what is this negative press? Who is doing it? And this is what drove me to start working on this project. Again, it's been going on for a little over a year, but the roundtable discussion and debate that I've been hosting and producing are to bring in the key thinkers. Now, who is Joe Allen? Does anyone know who he is? Joe Allen wrote a best-selling book on transhumanism, the war against humanity. It wasn't easy getting him to appear with us. He is Steve Bannon's watchdog. Do you know who Steve Bannon is? Okay. <laughs> Most of you, Steve Bannon, does anyone want to describe him? Uh, he, well, okay, he's a very right, right, right wing um, Trump supporter and antagonist. He is out to get transhumanists. Now, let me preface this by saying I really like Joe Allen. He came to visit my husband and myself in Scottsdale, Arizona, where we live. I declined to go because he is a bit of a misogynist, but I wish I had gone because he is really a funny person. And I think that not befriending him, but having a conversation with him will help us open up our eyes as to what is going on so we can counter it. And that's the whole purpose of my talk, and I'll try to get there as quickly as possible, but I'm gonna bring in another one. Um, that was tasty, but I want something else for you all. I'll move quickly here past this, and let's see if we can get to it. <clears throat> okay, so here is my statement for the discussion. Transhumanism comes in many varieties. <coughs> there is no fact of the matter about what trans true transhumanism is, just as there is no fact of the matter about what constitutes true Christianity. My primary contention here will be that the most influential versions of transhumanism, beginning with extropianism, but including subsequent variants like singularitarianism, cosmism, and even long-termism, are philosophically flawed and profoundly dangerous. A minimal definition of transhumanism could be the project to use advanced technologies to radically re-engineer the human organism. The movement that coalesced around this project over the past 30 years forms the backbone of what I call the test wheel bundle of ideologies, where the acronym test wheel stands for transhumanism, extropianism, singularitarianism, cosmism, rationalism, effective altruism, and long-termism. The roots of this bundle lie in the 20th century eugenics movement. And at the bundle's core is a techno-utopian vision of the future in which technology will solve all our problems, enabling us to live forever, overcome suffering, conquer the natural world, maximize economic productivity, and ultimately spread beyond Earth to build a sprawling multi-galactic civilization among the stars full of astronomical amounts of value. The philosophical problems with this worldview are many, and leading transhumanists embrace a deeply impoverished vision of human enhancement whereby the underlying values that determine what constitutes an enhancement derive from a uniquely Western white male capitalistic perspective. Okay. That is Emil Torres. Very um, fluent on Twitter. Very strong anti-transhumanist. Um, he's created an acronym called Tescreal. And he's kind of bundled Oh, oh, I'm sorry, thank you. I'm, I'm, I'm doing what I criticized before. But let me be warned about it. Thank you so much for bringing that to my attention. He created an acronym called TESCREAL, where he's bundling these different theoretical beliefs and some practices together to bring us down. And he's after Nick Bostrom. If any of you know Nick Bostrom, he is a friend to most of us, if not all of us. He's someone we respect very highly and someone who does not deserve that type of treatment. Um, in any case, 
Phil Torres is a philosopher, he's a professor at a university, and he is making his name known as very strongly anti-transhumanist based on an assumptive collaboration of these different acronyms to make a point that it is a movement. <coughs> Uh, David Wood standing back there was very articulate in, in addressing this. I don't have all of it, but you can see this on YouTube. Uh, so that's one, another, another opinion. And let's go to the Okay, last so one. here is my... Oh, no, here, sorry. Transhumanism has failed to seriously contend with the momentous ethical challenges signaled by our potential transhuman becoming. It answers the ethical question of whether we should proceed at full tilt with a resounding yes before asking what route we should be taking. After all, science and technology may provide a story about what life is, but they cannot tell us what life is for. Another reason why understanding transhumanism is so important is that it has become incredibly influential with some of the most powerful people on the planet Earth today. Uh, in particular, the technology elites of Silicon Valley. It animates their imaginations and explains their aims and projects. And this points to another immediate failing with transhumanism. In the era of the Anthropocene, the age where the devastating human impact on planet Earth is so great it will be visible for at least millions of years to come, it celebrates the version of humanity at the epicenter of our epochal crises. The grand narrative implicit in capitalism, the endless, that endless growth is realizable, is supported by the grand narrative of transhumanism. Okay, grand narrative, all white men. I think I see a woman sitting there. One of the complaints is it's all white men. I debated that at the end, which I don't have, but if you wanna watch this, I strongly make my argument as profoundly as possible. So what are they doing? Transhumanism. Here, let me go to, what they're doing is confirmation bias. They have a theoretical approach, each one slightly different than the ones <coughs> that they're proving within their particular departments, whether it's Steve Bannon, you know, right wing, um, watchdog, transhumanist watchdog, or whether it's in academics, in their philosophy departments, and anthropology departments, to prove that transhumanism is a very bad idea. But the assumptions that they're pinning to transhumanism can be disproven very, very easily. I won't go into that now, but I'm going to tell you what I'm doing about it. I'm very much a producer. I like to deal with problems and find solutions. This is a big problem that needs a solution. So um, the tendency to search for, interpret, favor, and recall information in a way that confirms or supports one's prior beliefs or values, which if you listen carefully to what they were saying was precisely what they were doing. Okay, so this is my response. Uh, could I have a time check, please? We're about halfway. Catherine. Okay, this is my response to it. So I thought, okay, what am I going to do? I do usually three to five interviews with magazines or newspapers or podcasts, radio, etc., a month. So if you add that up over the years, that's a heck of a lot of interviews. Apparently, I failed greatly because I haven't made too much of a dent. Now that's maybe because I'm a not a white male capitalist or maybe it's because I'm not off into space flying off someplace, or maybe it's because the, they, I don't fit their arguments. I'm not the only one. There are so many others here among us that have been dealing with this over and over and over again, yet our voices are not heard, and I attribute this to what I said in the very beginning, it's the, um, the, the clickbait. And it's kind of like a drive-by, um, uh, I can't remember what I used to call it, it's a, it's a drive-by hit, any term, any word, all white male, capitalist, uh, want to live forever, immortalist, um, AI don't care about the rest of the world, elitist, Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley, Silicon Valley. Transhumanism did not start in Silicon Valley, that's a misnomer. It did not start with all white men. In fact, one of the first transhumanists 
was genderless and he was Iranian. So, excuse me very much, where is the fact in that? The eugenics issue is another one. It is tied to a biologist who was of a different period where the progressives <coughs> had a different notion about um, genetic engineering, etc. But I have all of this in this document that I'm currently working on. To collaborate with me are Andrew Sandberg, of course, and David Wood, and some others, Mark Ruse here. Um, we've been looking at this very diligently. What are the key arguments that we need to pull out? And how concisely and concretely can we give a response to their arguments so that when people look at this, whether it's students or scholars or journalists or the mainstream, they don't read a lot of words, which would be a lot of noise. They get to the points very quickly. If you notice what they said in their drive-by coinage, all white men, Silicon Valley, elitists, don't care about the rest. What are some other things? Do you remember? Those are the ones that stand out the most. Eugenics, they said? Yeah. Right, that was very loud and clear. So if you listen to some of the words that they're saying, if you pull those out and find the connections of what, how they got there and what they're doing with it, it's a better way to understand the larger picture of why there is some confusion. Now, transhumanism is not a bad idea by any stretch of the imagination. We wouldn't be here if it was. But it's, it's oftentimes when an idea gains so much momentum and has so much promise and potentiality and existential opportunity for people that they get a little afraid. Transhumanism is about changing the human condition. But what is that condition we want to change? Certainly it's disease and death, um, unhappiness, problems, um, this type of behavior uh, where you have bias, intentional bias. I think that's the key here. And the intentional bias, the, the pernicious prattle of, an, of noise that people get on this, on the social media, and me too and like it. This is something that isn't good for humanity, it's not good for our consciousness, and it certainly is not good for our well-being. So in this draft of the transhumanism affirmation, it's going to be very short, to the point, and deal with the key issues and I'll name them out for you in just a moment. But I think this might do some good because we're gonna blast it out. And the other um, way to deal with this is not just through a very simple statement that's out there and accessible. Now, just a little caveat here. Most articles and papers about transhumanism defending it or explaining it are very lengthy, they're very academic, very um, beautifully written, and certainly eloquent in their verbose, um, necessary theoretical approach. But people don't see that today. They want something, a bite. They want something that they can grab onto very quickly and understand what the arguments are and how to best defend them. Okay, so in a summary of this document, this is like the, an open letter or an, it'll be available to everyone. It, there'll be people who can sign it if they choose. It's a collaborative project. If someone can write it better than me, um, which they already have, <laughs> thanks to Andrews and David and Mark and, and Max and Russell and others. Um, the aim is to make it simple and clear. And when you're dealing with the, the mad rush of social media um, hate speech, let's just be frank and call it that, we need to understand why there is this and what we can do about it. Okay, uh, first claim, transhumanism lacks diversity and all white um, male elitists. Silicon Valley, might well who are they mentioning? Elon Musk? Right? Largely. Ray Kurzweil, largely. And others. These are just names that they're picking and choosing because these two people are very famous. They're very well known. So they're very easy to choose to argue against. Transhumanism isn't all about Elon Musk and Ray Kurzweil. Certainly they are transhumanists. Certainly Ray Kurzweil is a good friend. Not Elon, I don't know Elon Musk personally. But Ray is a very dear friend. He would be horrified to read this. So that is just for them to get more clickbait on their journalistic articles that they're writing or academic papers. Number two, transhumanists only 
uh, uh, benefit the rich through capitalist economies. Well, <coughs> capitalism isn't part of transhumanism. It never has been. There's something called free markets. And free markets better defines one aspect of transhumanist economics, socialism is another. But if we look at capitalism, whenever that term is used, it's used incorrectly. There are numerous types of capitalism. It's not just one big paintbrush stroke. So um, that is, a, again, a, a, a drive-by term used to catch the eyes because capitalism is so disliked today around the world. But free markets and open systems, open markets. Um, okay, very good. Um, um, here's one. Uh, Transhumanist believes that technology can fix everything. Not so. We wouldn't be here if it could. We, know, we need community. Community is one of the most important things that we have for our well-being and our longevity. Um, Transhumans want to leave biology behind. Well, frankly, I don't. I don't mind uploading at some point, but I work out, I love my body, sex is great, all these wonderful things, the feeling and emotions are delightful. Um, transhumanism is the same as egalitarianism and long-termism, et cetera, et cetera. So there are 10 points that we've derived from these different discussions I've had with well-known anti-transhumanists. Now, these are just not people walking down the street. These are people who are very well-known within their specific fields as either troublemakers or antagonists or whatever, but that's fine. They can have their view. I don't care. I'm not out to convince them because you cannot convince them. I'm out to find out what the issues are and explain very clearly why those issues have so many holes in them. Um, the next thing I'll show you here, as I wrap up my intention, why is this important? And Anders asked me, well, do we need to do this or shouldn't we be working towards making transhumanism more mainstream? And I said both. We can't make it more mainstream, to make it more of a household term, to get people to understand what it really is, unless and until we deal with some of the issues that are being pounded out, repeatedly cut and paste, not only in articles and newspapers, but also magazines and academic papers. How do we stop that? This is one solution. Another one is called pre-bugging. And I don't have time to get into it, but it's, it's a methodology that can be used in stopping naysaying and disinformation. So it boils down to misinformation and disinformation. But more importantly, for those of us who support a worldview that is, has a rational optimism, pragmatic sensibility about the benefits of technology, the benefits of longevity, the benefits of Exidential opportunities for everyone, abundance if you want to use that term, the health and well-being of society has a movement that can help it. And it is the strongest movement in the world and that is transhumanism. So the takeaway for all of us is number one, exercise, get out there, walk. Thank you very much. The walking here is spectacular. <laughs> Number two, your diet, what you're eating, it feeds your brain, it makes your brain healthy. You should eat for your brain, considering that dementia is on the rise and tripling. Sleep like a baby and keep your friends as close as possible. Your friends, your community are your well-being. And in transhumanism, I think it ought to be one of our strongest goals to make our community as positive, as honest, and as fair as possible. Thank you.